Good evening, New Bedford Guide, New Bedford Residents. Chris Rosendi's back again for the Chris Rosendi Show. Uh, last week's episode was so good, we ran out of time. Uh, we had a great, great guest, Nick Correa. Uh, luckily, it worked out. He has the time to come back this week, and uh, we'll continue the conversation from last week. Uh, last week, we touched upon the broken Nick for most of the show. Uh, we'll start back up with the broken Nick a little bit and work our way to today, the fix Nick. The guy that's here today, excited to be here, excited to touch somebody's life tonight, and excited to make a change for somebody today. Uh, he, was, he came in with a little bit of fire in him tonight. Uh, he was excited about last show. He got a lot of uh, messages and uh, well wishes from watches up until his way on, uh, to the show today. A lady said she saw him and uh, she gave him a little hope. It's a great thing. That's what we hope to do with these shows every single week. Uh, it's not just the shows that I've been doing, the, the mental health, the cancer. We're all broken, uh, guys. Every single one of us, every single person on this earth, we're all broken. There's not one man or woman or child who's perfect. I, for one, do these shows to try to help every week. Uh, but you look at our pages. I mean, my wife's awesome at pictures uh, and getting the kids all done up. And, you know, she's an elaborate party planner. And, you know, we always have such great pictures. I mean, the awesome bulldog helps. But, uh, you know, we have pictures of these kids. And it seems like on Facebook, all you see are people's highlight reels. You know, my highlight reel is me and my son playing baseball, my daughter kissing me, my wife holding my hand and being somewhere. But I, too, I may not be an addict, I may not be suicidal, but I am broken myself. I'm very broken. There's a lot of us that all have stuff about us that's just not right, that we must work upon to make better. Uh, looking down at people, I used to do that stuff. That's something that I was broken in, but I try to do better at. I'm not there yet, but I'm trying. Working with all these people that, you know, with the mental issues, the, the drug opioid addiction, the, the cancer, has helped me see a perspective that I really didn't look at back in the day. I'm also broken in the ways that I like, I have anger issues, uh, you know, that cause havoc in my relationship with my wife sometimes. I don't mean, there's not abuse or anything like that, but you know, we get snappy with each other, and it's stuff that, minor stuff that bothers me, that really ticks me off, that really sets off a bad vibe in the house. And that's stuff that I'm broken in, just a small example. There's a ton more I could go on for the whole show. But work on what you're broken. Pick one little aspect of your life. You can't just change dramatically your whole life, but try to do what I'm doing. Just identify. Have somebody that you love and trust identify an issue with you, even if it's not addiction. We're all broken. We all need some fixing. And to start helping yourself from within is part of the solution. I hope one day to conquer each and every broken piece of me. It's going to be a long process, and you know, by the grace of God, and with my faith, and with my family, and my loved ones and friends, maybe I can get past the uh, broken parts of me and uh, be a better person. Stay kind, everybody. Work on yourselves, and be kind to others. Tonight's guest, Nick Correa, is brought to you by the Cask and Pig Kitchen Ale House in Dartmouth, 780 State Road, North Dartmouth, Mass, 02748. Mario has got a great, great happy hour menu, as he calls it. Stop by, great atmosphere, tons of TVs. I've been watching the World Cup there. Uh, the food is excellent, the atmosphere is great, and it's a, owned by a restaurant owner who's always, always contributing to the well of our community. Every time I've had something I've asked Mario for to help a child in need or a toy drive or gift cards for whatever, he steps right up. Cask and Pig, Kitchen and Ale House. Good people, good food, good place, awesome atmosphere. Without further ado, tonight, back again, my friend Nick Correa. Yeah. Hey, Nick, how you doing, buddy? Hey, how are you? Nick, last week we started from high school and we worked our way to your, right where you got to sobriety. Yeah. Uh, I think we left off right around where you, uh, every morning you wake up, get on your knees, and thank the good Lord for your sobriety. Yeah, and it's big, humbling, gratitude. You've got to be grateful, you know. Sometimes things happen that are out of our control or, you know, we might not have everything we want. But I certainly have everything I need, and without God and my recovery, I would never be able to do that. 
Have you ever relapsed since your last main recovery? Have you been on this narrow, straight? Straight and narrow. I mean, I'm, I'm very robotic in f as far as like my schedule, my routine. Like I need to be in bed. I need to be up relatively at the same time. You know, uh, for me to stay clean and to stay sober, July was, July 1st was 62 months for me, you know? And it feels great, you know? Like the 4th of July yesterday, was like a blessing for me. I, I mean, I had an amazing time, and if I was drinking, I wouldn't have remembered. And if I was using drugs, I would have been hidden in a basement or hidden in a room somewhere, and not not wanted to interact with anybody and not be present. And to be able to get up yesterday and enjoy the sun and just laugh and smile, I, I felt like you know a twelve year old that's free, like running in a field. You know, thirty seven years old, going on obstacle courses, slipping slides, playing volleyball. Do you feel like you've lost a lot throughout that years of, you know, being broken and being a, a victim of addiction and, you know? I don't know what I lost. You lose time, but I know that if I didn't go through that rough patch, then I would have never found out who my true self was. Because up until I, I got sober this last time, I think that's when I finally discovered, you know, who I was supposed to be, the man God intended me to be. And, you know, I did lose some years in time, but... That being said, I think the rest of the time that I'm on this earth is going to be amazing. That's excellent. It's a good uh, plan. It's a good desire to have. And yeah. It's great faith to have, you know, in yourself that you're going to continue to live and live a good life and productive life. Now, during that time period, though, I know I, I, it's kind of like a secondary question to the sure. last question. Have you lost people that maybe because of your addiction that you regret now? And have you been able to build bridges back with these people? Or are there some that you'd rather not? No, I think that, you know, one of the biggest things when you get sober and when you recover, uh, you got to make amends to people. And you have to apologize to people you did stuff to as long as it doesn't inflict harm on them. But did I lose people? I lost people to death. I lost people that I was friends with that passed away, you know. Uh, one of my best friends, Nick, I, I mean... Billy, I think about those guys a lot, especially Nick. I mean, I, I was friends with him. Since Herbs I was, is a good dude, too. Yeah, he was the best, you know. And not a day doesn't go by that I don't think about him, you know. And, you know, Billy, too, like, you know, Billy Bozart. He, I mean, I was close with him, you know, those guys. and That whole clique was, you know, you, the whole little group from high school up, I remember. That. Yeah. Like, you know, you guys were all tight and party animals and had a good time. Yeah. I knew Nick wasn't – man, Nick, he really didn't come across as the – the party animal, man. You know, he had it. It seemed always seemed to me like he had his stuff together. You know what I mean? That's what's crazy. What people don't realize is like, drugs don't discriminate. Like I've seen people from every state. There's people from every state in this country that rich, middle class, poor. It doesn't matter who you are. Once you get bit by that, it's over. I don't care how strong you think you are, how much will you think you have. Once it gets a hold of you, there's no going back. Once you jump in that ocean, there's no lifeline unless, unless you're looking for it, you know? Yeah. And, like, I, 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 was, I was very blessed that I had, you know, such a great support, support system, my mom and dad and uh, friends, my, my friends, the Dubois's and the Fabians. Like, those people were really, really helping me. You know, my family, Coach Rodericks and, and his, my cousin Ryan and Gretchen and Rebecca, like, People like looked out for me, you know what I mean? And you were lucky, you were very fortunate yeah, to have that. I see people that don't have that and it's way, way harder, you know? Because when I when I was, you know, struggling, like when I first got clean, like twenty dollars is a lot of money to you. Like, you know, that's that's the difference between like an extra value meal's pretty good if you're not eating great food, you know what I'm saying? And uh like you appreciate, don't have, you appreciate the little things once yeah, you get back to yeah. seeing the light. Yeah, it's true, man. It's true. It's more, than, it's more than cigarettes and state food, you know? So that's kind of the part of what uh, I had asked you, like, have you missed out on stuff? And you probably missed a lot of good meals and experiences. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Especially having this, like, broad range of friends and family that yeah. always are there for you. Yeah, definitely over those years, you know, I mean, but like I said, fortunately for me, like, it's all come back and, and then some, you know? Yeah. I didn't go down that road. If I don't walk down that road... I'm not where I am today. And where I am today, at this second, I wouldn't trade in for anything in the world. You know, if I could bring people back that I've lost to this illness, the people that have died, and if I could save their life, of course I would. Of course I would do anything in the world possible to bring people back, like friends who 
have kids and you know have to see their mom stand over their casket and cry like to me is like the worst thing and absolutely people don't realize it man like I, I when I was in sixth grade I wanted to play basketball and play football I don't want to be known as a heroin addict or an alcoholic or a bum you know I don't think anybody at there at that age strives to be a, a junkie yeah man that you, you know? know and people call you that and that word becomes hurtful because of it's course like, it is people like I would love someone all, all I can say is if you're doing if you have a good life and you have a normal life instead of casting a stone at a person Talk to them. You don't know what they've been through. Well, it's kind of like my opening. We're all broken, man. Yeah. Not one of us is better than no. the next guy. But that being said, my wife does it all the time, you know, and I deserve it, and others have. And sometimes, in my case, you got to be called an asshole to yeah. snap out of it. Sure. And yeah, that's hurtful. And yeah, you know, but sometimes you really need the tough love. At least I think so. And yeah. I understand it gets hurtful, and I understand you didn't want to grow up to be that way. And I kind of understand... It being different than my personality of being like snappy sometimes. Sure. The, and it's a totally, it's not a parallel example at all, but it does to me a little bit validate the need sometimes for those tough words, you know what I mean? To, to be told. It's just, you know, I, I know I, you may not agree, and if you don't, say so. I don't, you know. I, I agree with the tough love. Uh, I think when it comes to drugs and alcohol, like, you know, calling people words like that, 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 that really frustrates me. But, you know, you can't enable someone. And if I make your life comfortable and I know you're using drugs and you live with me, why would you get clean if yeah. you have a roof over your head, a shower, and yeah. the ability to stay somewhere? There's nothing there. I, let me go back to my last point. Mm. I don't mean driving by the stranger and saying, hey, you effing junkie, get out of the way. That's not what I mean. I mean, like, friends. Like, right. bro, you're a junkie right now. You know, that's how, that's the context sure. I meant it in, not just random strangers walking by them. That's just cruel and right, right, unnecessary right. because, you know, what did you gain from calling that person a joke? Right, right, right. Nothing. But what I mean is like, you know, the relationship, like I, I use the example of my wife or yeah, yeah. the example of, you know, if I was to say, dude, you're like a damn junkie, bro. Yeah. So in, in my experience, when people are at that point, like you're not going to, it's, it's a very, very fine and tricky line to help someone recover, like hurting them so we have a saying if if you're gonna if you're not gonna help an addict leave them alone if you're gonna hurt them you know don't 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 try to hurt an addict help them you know because at that point believe it or not like you can say whatever you want my mother could have said a thousand things to me my father my friends you just weren't ready i wasn't ready you know and when i was ready i knew it i knew it i knew at that second when i went to gosnell that last time and i was walking laps around the halls and a lady was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to change. Like, this is it. It's over. And I felt it. And the other times, you know, I would just try to lie, tell my counselor I had to leave, the hide in the bathroom and read a book instead of paying attention, you know, making my own plan. And it was very unsuccessful when I started listening. And the biggest thing I had to do was surrender, you know. Yeah. Until I surrendered then, I was never going to make it. It's just a tough, tough thing to see, like, you know, People like yourself, who I've known, been around, to how does it get to that, you know? And, and, and I know that yours was the party thing. And I, I'm not trying to divert or victim blame or, or cast blame on anyone other than the addict themselves. Because mm. it is, you know, a disease. And it is a choice, too. It's kind of both. Uh, that's the way I'm concerned. I think that once you make that choice to start using those drugs, then it becomes a disease of addiction afterwards, you know? Because it's almost like diabetes is a disease, right? Mm. We can agree on that. But if you, don't, if you don't eat like shit and you stop, a lot of people aren't diabetic anymore. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I equate it to that a little bit. And I may be off a little bit, but I've thought about it. I've, I've actively tried to advocate mm. to help people. So I'm not... Sure. I'm not loosely, you know, throwing salt on, on right. it, but... I think there's a little bit of choice involved in that. Well, here's the thing. Like, people say that, but if you read the doctor's note in the big book, it explains it really, really well. So people can say there's a choice, but when it comes down to it, and this was my experience, like, if me and you both go have a beer, right, you can go home. There's a pretty good chance I'm going to have 25 more. It may not be that night, but yeah. my brain, like, when I, have, when I put that in me, it may not be night one, it may not be night two, 
but eventually, eventually it's going to turn into 30 beers. It, yeah, and I'm going to be Indiana Jones and you better fit running around wild, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't have that ability or that switch with alcohol to just stop. I never have, you know? I never have. When I was 16 and I tasted liquor, I thought it was the, the greatest thing in the world, and I threw up all over myself. I peed all over myself. And it was still a great time. Yeah, the next day I was trying to get more, you know? How do you feel... There's two things that I came across. Uh, I listened to a podcast today, a uh, New York Daily podcast, mm-hmm. and uh, I think it was recorded yesterday or the day before, and it had to do with a, a couple in New York. She was prescribed fentanyl patches, which I didn't even know existed, to be honest yeah. with you. And uh, they'd share them, her and her husband or boyfriend at the time, and cut it in half and suck the yeah, gel sure. out and then put it in their mouth or whatever. And uh, he ended up overdosing. A week later, she tried killing herself from the guilt, then she finally snapped out of it, went to a rehab. At the rehab, she got arrested for third-degree murder. The murder involves her prescription being used in the death of... So she was basically a drug dealer. Mm. In her case, I don't consider her a drug dealer because it could have easily been... They were sharing, you know? The, sure. Her day today was to share that patch. His day yesterday was to get the bag of dope. Right. Um, how do you feel about that, man? It, it, really made, it really got the wheels spinning right now. Do you feel like we should prosecute dealers or not or you know in that case she really wasn't a dealer so there is a gray line right there you know I think there's probably going to be a gray line in every case you handle like that you know what I mean Uh, how do you feel about it it's listen I wish all drugs were gone from the face of the earth the reality is they're not going to be what people don't realize is sometimes people selling drugs are just trying to make money to get high themselves. That's what I'm saying. That's you know, in the... and, and, and the street level dealers, whatever, there's a thousand of them. You know, why don't we try to go after the cartels where it all comes from? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like in a lot of these people, they're just throwing in jail that are drug addicts. They're not helping them. They're just making matters worse. You know, they need therapy and they need treatment. So if it was a case, in my opinion, and you know the person's using drugs, would I put them in jail? No, I wouldn't. I would put them in a treatment facility somewhere and try to help them, you know? What if it was just a money-making drug deal? That's a little different, you know? You would try them? If, if you know, of course, if there's evidence and they're doing it, yeah. And I mean, in every case is different, you know what I mean? It's just an opinion. Yeah, every You don't case, have to justify your opinion with Every me, case you know? is different, but, well, you know, if, if you it. know you're putting fentanyl... In drugs and you're killing people, then yeah, man, you know, you yeah. deserve what you get. What is that, man? I don't get the fentanyl. It's, is it just like... It, it triples profit. It triples profit. So it's all money, even though and it's, it's just all, that calculated risk. It's all money. So the mind works in the way that if I know you have... The, the good best, dope. Well, I've heard it. Because in gone. the back of my van, I got addicts when I, you know, take out cruise community service. They're like, man, if I find out a dude overdoses... I'm going to get it. And I, I'm like, how the hell do you get there? How in the hell do you get there? Our mind is so polluted and poisoned when we're using that it plays tricks on us. And that's what people don't realize, you know? Yeah. That's Crazy. what people don't realize. You, um, you touched upon prison and jail. Mm. Uh, another fun stat that a lot of people probably don't realize is right now in America, 80% of people that are incarcerated have some sort of drug abuse issues during or prior to the crime they committed. I, Whether it's they're jonesing and they gotta get money oh yeah, or they're actually high and they committed a crime. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of guys that woke up at Ash Street after popping a bunch of Xanax oh, yeah. and not knowing what, why they're there, yeah. you know? Um, so we do have to really reclassify jail and substance abuse at some point. And mental, mental- uh, All of it's tied in. Mental illness. Absolutely. Because I mean, you know, a lot of people give the, the sheriff a lot of crap about his suicide rate at his prison, but he's also detoxing more than any other jail in the state. So with the detoxing comes people's minds that are clouded. Jamie Casey explained it on a, pre- a previous oh, yeah. edition where his drug usage mimicked mental illness. Of course, of course. You know, it really made him bipolar yeah, and all oh, that yeah, stuff. Absolutely. And then now once he cleared up, he just, he's fine. Sure. I don't agree with like i said if you know why why hasn't it been fixed though that's what baffles me like you know these guys are like detoxing and they keep killing themselves why do we keep putting them in the same the same spot like it's like saying okay um if you go in that water you know you you might get eaten by an alligator 
and then you just keep letting people go in that water. Well, when you release a fish into the water, it's going to swim. Right. So <laughs> you know, and that's that, that's just that. You know, I, I think there's got to be like something put in place to help them. You know, what absolutely. I mean? Like give them give them some medication. Do what you got to do. There's got to be an outpatient after jail, I think. They should be. or an integrated because I don't. I understand. How do I put this in the nicest fashion? I don't mind a hard detox because you can't die from right. From it. Well, some you can alcohol. You alcohol can. you can, but I'm saying that we're talking opioids. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. A, I don't mind going. Hey, you're locked up and throwing you in there for 30 days with some classes. You know, after because by 30 days you're you're not ready for treatment anyway. No, you're still hurting. Right. You know, especially oh, if yeah. you're on the methadone and all this other stuff. And then. Once you, once you get that cold turkey and you get that in your brain, like, oh, my God, that was the worst thing in my life, then maybe send you to an outpatient secure facility. I've done cold turkey like six times, bro. No, I'm saying you have, yeah. to, you have to do it in conjunction. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. Like it's, I think that the best thing from my personal experience, cold turkey, suboxone. And the last time I was in detox, I think I only took suboxins for two days and I took less than they recommended. You know, I, at that point, I knew I didn't want any more of it. But I think the best thing is therapy, knowledge, counseling, like things that people in recovery use all the time to, to feel the gift of sobriety, you know. And I think that stuff, and as a country, like the education, like people need to be aware of what's going on. And if we get rid of, you know, the stigma and... If we get a better understanding of it, then we can help people. 80%, like that's a crazy number to me. And a lot of jails don't allow AA, which is nuts. Seriously? Seriously. Well, they got rid of it. Any reason why? I don't know. I just know Is it don't. a staffing issue, which they'll probably blame that on? or I don't know. I mean, there's certain jails in Massachusetts that have put programming in, but there are other jails that don't even allow AA, yeah. which is kind of crazy. Speaking of AA, I ran across a good friend of mine. Uh, he's actually watching now. Uh, and he's recovering. He's, you know, he's in recovery. Mm. And he doesn't do any of that stuff. He's like, man, to each his own. He told me his exact words. I don't believe in a lot of that shit. But, you know, he did it his way. So there is not just one secret way of doing it. Everybody, he's told me that it's just like what you said. You knew that time that you mm. had to do it. It's either you do want to end it, like you did that one day. Mm -hmm. And you started, you know, going nuts and doing the Rocky at Gosnell. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or you don't. And that's exactly how he put it to me. He goes, man, and then I explained to him how I used to bring my other friend to AA meetings rather than NA meetings because of, you know, NA meetings is a shit show. It's just a younger crowd. It's people, like, booting up in the parking lot and, you know, I, right, I, I got one, one day. Yeah, there are, but there's, like, I got one day sobriety. Like, you know what I mean? I've been clean for one day. Where the AA tends to be the longer-term people. You just have more AAs. You just have more veterans. In yeah. It, you know? But I have been to some great NA meetings, too, you know. Uh, I think, honestly, for me, that stuff's important because for me, drinking and drugging was just, you know, 20, 25% of my problem. The reason of me doing all that stuff, um, I had to fix through counseling, through step work, through journaling, through prayer, uh, through sober circles. And I need that. Like if I'm having a bad day, like, and I need someone that can relate to me that I can call and that I can trust. And, you know, guys that have been through, um, the same path as me, then I feel more comfortable talking to them. And I see it, the numbers like of people that recover from using AA and NA is, is much higher than people just trying to do it on their own. But I guess, yeah, sure, there are some cases. And if he's happy... Everybody's different. Yeah, everyone's different to each his own. I'm not going to knock anyone, you know? Yeah. Uh, whatever works for you, you know? Whatever yeah. works for you. It's just, it was funny. He was like, hey, man, I, I really enjoyed your show last week. He prefaced it with that. And then, uh, then he said... But a lot of it I don't agree with. But everybody's different. I've slacked before what I've taken time off from meetings and just gotten caught up in life, and it happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know. You can trust that process that you were successful with. Them. Right, right. And, you know, and I like, like, I enjoy them, you know. Yeah. i got to take a break right now, guys. Uh, this podcast and show is brought to you by the Cask and Pig in Dartmouth. State Road in Dartmouth, Cask and Pig, happy hour, uh, appetizer specials, delicious, great food, great atmosphere, ton of TVs for every sporting event. Football season is coming. Um, I'm actually going to try to convince Mario to do some uh, fantasy football drafts at the uh, Cask and Pig. Fantasy football season's coming up. 
Uh, and I know Morrow's a, a big player in fantasy football, so uh, that's a whole, let me digress from the, as, from that. I'm a fantasy football guy, so I'm uh, talking about it. But yeah, stop by the Cask and Pig, guys, and uh, enjoy the atmosphere, the great food, and the specials that Mario has weekly. Support local businesses that support our community. Also tonight, if you're just joining, part two, Nick Korea. Last week's been awesome, and here we go again. 7.30, it feels like we've been talking for f uh, five minutes, and it's just yeah, flying by. Uh, you know, I also wanted to ask you, uh, Moore Haley recently, Attorney General, Massachusetts, is now suing pharmaceuticals. Do you feel this epidemic is not, I don't blame just one thing. I think it's a conjunction, no, no. it's a perfect storm of sure. everything. But I also do hold the farm, big farmer and doctors accountable for this uh, crisis. How do you feel about it? I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, when I was 27 and a doctor gave me 180 or 160 Percocets, whatever it was, it's clearly too much. Like you're giving that to a kid that you don't really, he didn't explain it well to me. And if he did, it was after surgery. So I don't really remember anyway, you know? And it's just like, it's mind blowing. Like the stuff I see people get, like, there's pill mills. You can just go in, you take, what's wrong? There's places for backs. Oh, I fell off a ladder. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. It's 400 for the x-ray. Here's your prescription. Go pay for it. And it's all cash. I mean, those guys know what they're doing. No, we're still involved. There's still that going around, you think? I, I mean, yeah, I bet you there is. I mean, there was six years ago when I was using it, and I don't think they've all disappeared by then. And there was a ton in Florida. I, People well, Florida was the was like yeah. the, the highway. Like Connecticut had some. Yeah, you get 180 per 30s, 180 per 30s. One stops. Drive in, drive out with it. Yeah. Well, you stop at a pharmacy. Right. And it's like you so know. So you just go in. Hey, I fell it. off a ladder. Here's your script. Take a couple X-rays. Cover my back. See you in a month. See you in a month if you want to show up. Yeah. And 180 per 30s for one month. Is that what you're saying? 180, 120 depends. You know where oh you go. Oh my goodness. Perk 15, Xanax. I mean, I used to get Xanax and, and Valium, and I had a guy give me methadone to go on an airplane one time. Like, I didn't, I mean, I talked to him into giving me methadone and Xanax, you know? A doctor, it's like, okay, here you go. Thank you. Make sure you don't take any perks with that. Yeah, right. This is for when I'm dope sick and I don't have money. Yeah. You know what I mean? No one watched me pee. Sometimes I would just fail because I was lazy, but if I knew it's only a slap in the wrist, then why, why would I stop, you know? But if I can bring one in the, the bathroom and just empty it in a thing without anyone checking me, then this is perfect. This is a great wave to ride, you know? Goodness gracious. And they're just in it for the money. Yeah. So there is a, you know, I, I had uh, Dr. Mike and Dr. Bonnie Burl on to discuss that aspect of sure. it. Sure. You know? From what Bonnie told me, a lot of it had to do with uh, improper training, the whole pain, mm -hmm. uh, the whole pain threshold, one through 10 smiley faces, yep. and all that. Like, hey man, you're supposed to not feel any pain. Like, no, you get a broken arm, you're gonna feel a little pain. Right. So they've gone from, hey, to easing the pain, to over medicating. Over medicating and just totally numbing the pain. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I went one time and I was like, um, Last time the doctor gave me these things called Vicodin and they made me really, really sick to my stomach, but the ibuprofen didn't work. And the guy was like, oh, we'll, we'll give you this stuff called Percocet. I was like, really, what is that? I never heard of it. And I was on like eight in his office. You know what I mean? It's just, you could just lie and just go places. So you just yeah, play the game, man. Of course. Great. Sick mind, you know what I mean? Well, it's a survival mode. Right. You enter survival mode and you, you have to become a conniver, you have to become a schemer. It's like crime, uh, a criminologist, famous criminologist, I forget his name now. You know, when a person moves into a neighborhood and it's filled with crime, it's like terrible to them, like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. Then over time, it becomes normal. Yeah. And then after that, and this is all scientifically proven. Oh, of course. You start hustling and doing the crime yourself because your body is trained and your mind is actually switched over. Yeah. And your moral compass is switched by your environment. You product know? of your environment. Your environment and your addiction. Product mm -hmm. of your addiction is becoming a scam artist mm -hmm. and a dishonest person. Something that I don't really see you as. No. You know, I never have. No. So now, let's move on to the good part, man. 
7.35, we have about 25 minutes. I really, want, I really, really want to talk about your coaching. And, and now, I mean, you always coached, but now it's different. It's different. I'm not really, well, I did. I coached. Well, you, you coached coach people in the gym, football. man. Yeah, but I went to the New Bedford Eye football and New Bedford Eye basketball last year. I sat on the bench. And, you know, I don't get to go. Last year I wasn't working my new job. So this year maybe I'll... I'll go to a few more practices, you know, I'll have the time, but it dep- it's tough if I'm working and working people out, yeah. juggling a schedule. You gotta make money too. Yeah, but I'm always at the games, you know, and I'm always rooting for my kids, and I went to a ton of the Tabor games last year because I worked a lot of those guys out. Uh, I had some guys at Stang, Wareham, you know, so a Poniquit this year, so Chris is going to BC, I'm not gonna miss too many of those games. You know, New Bedford High football. Chris I, being? Chris Heron Jr. Yeah. it's my guy. Done a lot of work with him. Yeah, Noah's going to Woodstock in Connecticut. To Which big, is a prep school, right? Big time prep school. He just went on a visit to Pitt. He's been to Virginia. So, you know, I want to watch those guys play because I've worked hand in hand with them. And, I, I, you know, it's, that's what I love doing. They remind me of um, the New Bedford High kids like Wilson, Ryan, Brian, Jerome, AJ, those kids that I worked and got to coach when I was first starting. You know, Marcel, Antoine, I mean, those kids were my – those kids were the best. I don't know. It's like I was 22 and they're all my little brothers, you know? That's I get excited when I talk about that. Absolutely, man. It's a, they're part of your product, part of your healing, yeah. part of your, you know, this is, this is what I can accomplish now. Sure. I couldn't do this. The old no. Nick wasn't able to complete these projects and now the new Nick can't. Right. And the football team, you know, I'm putting pressure on them right now because we should have a great season this year. Hey, you're saying he's calling it, guys. What's his record you said? We shouldn't lose more. You know what? I don't think we should lose a game. Yeah. I'm going to call out JJ right now. JJ, I heard you haven't been hitting the weights, bro. No, no. You weren't doing good in the weights, and you know I look out for you, man. He wasn't there this winter. You better, uh, you better step it up. you got some time to make up for. Yeah. You're a good player. and you know, Very good player. And it all, good kid. it all has to be part of it, man. There's four parts to being a good athlete, and just uh, talent is just one of them, man. Yeah. I got a few questions that I have to get to. This is an interactive show. We're going to go on after this. Tommy Brown asked, Chris, could you ask how somebody would uh, go about trying to speak to people in recovery? How do you get the opportunity to go to these places and and tell your story to help others? You go to meetings. uh, You join a home group, which is the base of the meeting. Then you start going into different detoxes. You start going to different, you know, facilities that people are in that, you know, are trying to get better and you start talking to them. You yeah. know, you start small, build up, and then yeah. wherever you end up, you end up. Tommy Brown is a friend of mine. I'm going to have him message you yeah. and ask because you guys can kid. work that out. Tommy's awesome, man. My fantasy football league. Really? Yeah. It's pretty good at I sports. won three out of five leagues last year, and wow. Tommy's in my church league. I, I got bombed in, man. I got I he's did terrible. terrible sports. I, he's just he's a sport guy. Yeah. He's a good father. Um, Rosalie Venter, keep helping. You are doing a great service to many people. John Sylvia, my last detox. John I had on the show. He now works at PACA. My last detox was in Dartmouth. Worst experience ever. It saved my life, as miserable as it was. And then uh, Louis St. Michael, for you. I'm going to have Louis, why don't you, if you're still, Louise, excuse me, if you're still watching. Uh, I think grade five students and up should listen to Nick's story. Drug use is starting earlier than high school. And I think she also asked if there was a way you could talk to some students. Yeah, just so maybe message back. me. Yeah, Louise St. Michael, uh, if you could message Nick, or maybe Nick can go back in the comments later sure, on absolutely. and uh, send you a PM. And then somebody said that you had spoke. Uh, recovery can never be forced. Wilson says, uh, my man. And uh, Jean St. Pierre started with what we talked about. It's structure. I live by it 30 years sure. clean. Now your pride and joy. Your new job. I know you were super gassed about it, man. On Facebook, it was like you hit the lottery. It is. It still is. Tell I us know. about it. What is it? What are you doing? So, Where is it? And uh, how, how does it make you feel to work for somebody who's been there for you? It's in Seekonk, Mass. It's called uh, Heron Wellness Group. And I'm sure people know who Chris Heron is. He's a former NBA player, uh, Boston Celtics, Denver Nuggets. Durfee, great, McDonald's All-American, Fresno State, Jerry Tarkanian. And he struggled with addiction. And this August, he will be 10 years clean and sober. And he also started something called the Heron Project, 
which I think gave out, I want to say, around roughly $2.5 million to people to get into treatment last year. And Thanksgiving break, I went to work out Chris Jr., and he called me over his house. He told me he was opening a facility, and he wanted me to be the trainer and, you know, run some groups and, and do some stuff with sobriety, and that's what I do every day, and it's amazing, like... Nine to five, or do we... Seven to three. I'm there early. We get cranking in the weight room early there. That's good. Yeah. I did a live video today after my 40 minutes on the bike. I was uh, 6.15. I was on live talking about the show tonight. Yeah. Get up early, man. Get it done. Get up. Get it going. But nothing like getting paid to work out, huh? No. It's, it, and the best part is, like, when you see the difference in a person in 60 days or 90 days and you see the changes they're making in the relationships, like, every guest there to me, like, I'll have a bond with them forever, you know? Like just because like I've helped them. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I, right the, here, the last comments from Wilson Pilate. Nick coached me and is like my brother. Yeah. One of my best guys I know and I'm glad and very proud of him. I mean, what else, you know, yeah, to your point right there. And, and, and they help me too, you know? Of course. It's, and Chris is like the best. And not only that, the staff he has there, uh, his wife, Heather, Lori McCarthy, our director, is amazing. We have two amazing counselors. We have amazing staff, all our wellness associates. It's just Glenn Featherstone, former Boston Bruin, works there. He's a great, great guy. Did he have issues with uh Yeah, he's, every, every, pretty much everyone that works there did, man, and that's what's great to see, you know? Feather was, I mean, I could probably get him here. That'd be a great interview. This guy played in the NHL for 13 seasons. Yeah. Set it up. I'd love to have both of you on. Yeah. We'll throw Kevin in the front and it'll be like WrestleMania the old days. Yeah, Rosario, that's my guy. He's the best. You know, yeah. energy, passion. Like the first meeting I ever went to, I was actually high on perk thirties and I was trying to wean off them myself and I listened to him speak and I was like, Wow, this guy, like, he's changed, like Dude, I almost cried a couple times on this show and that dude almost made me cry. Yeah. Talking about his mom and everything yeah. else. Dude, I was like, all right, you knock it off. I'm going to sit here yeah. and cry in front of, uh, you know, well, we have thousands of views and yeah. podcast downloads. So it's, he's just a powerful dude. Yeah. So your day to day, seven to three. You always stay a little later too because yeah. it's fun. Chris stay involved a lot in that? He is. I don't know how he does it. That, that guy does not stop. He is there. Some days sun up to sundown, he goes speaks at schools, and when he can be there, he's there. If he flies in sometimes, at 10 at night, he'll go by there to see people, you know? His family goes there, and, you know, we had a great 4th of July cookout yesterday. Everyone's family was invited, and it was just, like I said, an amazing, amazing day just to see people with common issues and struggle, smile, yeah. laugh. Like, the, my mom, was probably my biggest thing and like being able to see a mom's face change when they see their son or daughter for the first time. It's a different time. look now, huh? Yeah. My mother like when she, you know, seeing me like that one year chip and then, you know, showing her the one Chris gave me my five year one, like that's better than a brand new house to me, you know? Because you can, you can buy a house. You're building your foundation right you gotta, now. Anyway, that's, you, your, that's a strong, yeah. strong, you know. You got to earn that. Heck yeah. You got to earn that chip. You know, and to have the guy who's been like my mentor give it to me, like, that's huge. That's like winning a gold medal, medal at the Olympics, you know. So you're just proud to work for him, man. Yeah. So it's just like your dream job, huh? It is. It really is. And then you still do the training on the sides, obviously. Like I do. That, you know? I was. Uh, so that's also a passion. No matter what, I have a feeling that if, like, Chris is like, I'm giving you 100K a year, something a good pay, 120K a year, you'd still do this stuff on the side, huh? I would. I just, I can't. I always say that I can't leave New Bedford, you know, New Bedford. Well, so. you had asked me, I want to move, maybe thinking about far. I can't get away from New Bedford. Yeah. All in one sentence, you know. I can't. It's just entrenched in me, you know. I think back to 1989, New Bedford High basketball, my uncle on the sidelines being there. And, you know, it's like, it's like being a little kid and seeing Santa Claus put presents under the tree. It was so, it was unbelievable to me. And, you know, you look up to those guys and it's amazing the bond I have. Like, when you go through a tough time, I can always call one of my former Whaler teammates, John C., Johnny Silva, um, you know, Timmy Walsh, and we'll always have that bond. No matter what, you know, it will never be broken, and that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's i got to cool. actually send John C. the message. He keeps 
advertising on Facebook for his famous DUI services. He's I'm going to have him sponsor a show, man. He should. He's, he'll do you it. Know? There's a ton of uh, good stuff happening here and uh, way more views than he's getting yeah. <laughs> for his product. Uh, cheap uh, little <laughs> insert right there. Uh, now, you got a kid, Chris Pelletier. I don't understand the question too much, but he's asking, can you ask him how many times he has had withdrawal since? It's probably just after you're... After you yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's the physical withdrawals aren't as bad as the mental ones. Well, the mental is like, it's almost like when you when I quit cigarettes. Yeah, it's not just the nicotine I quit. I quit opening the pack. Oh yeah. I quit tapping that thing. I quit messing with the lighter in my pocket. Mm. I quit that first drag. Oh yeah, it's the whole shebang. I quit all that too. Yeah. And a lot of people the don't ritual. realize that, you know, and uh, you have to. There's a void that's left when you quit. And I think a lot of that has to do with Chris's, you know, being here, being there, being everywhere, keeping busy. Uh, he has to fill that void because there's an empty spot there where addiction was. Yeah. You have to put something there in sure. life. You just can't leave an empty spot in your no. life, you know. His biggest thing is he likes helping people and touching lives. Yeah. That's what I've, I've noticed. So that's where he shoveled that into the spot where uh, yeah. the addiction was. Yeah. I had a guy, uh, a friend of mine, Mark Vidal. You know, oh, Mark, yeah. yeah, just with him. Uh, many years ago, this stuck with me. I was like, "Hey, your son's doing awesome in boxing." He's like, "Yeah, blah blah blah." I ran into a stop and shop, and uh, he may not remember this conversation because we hadn't seen each other in years. And he said, uh, "Telling me that my daughter does this, blah blah blah, I blah blah, da da da." Yeah, he's just like going on and on. I'm like, "Dude, how do you do it?" And he goes, "The reason why I got in all the shit I got into as a kid, I wasn't busy enough." Yeah. He goes, I'm keeping them busy as much as I can sure. because when they're busy, they're not in trouble. That's right. You know, and I t try to tell people that all the time. You know, be, you know, I do it sometimes. I mean, I met with Mike from New Bedford Guy the other day, and I had to sit down and have a conversation with him, but I had Bray with me. And uh, Bray was on his tablet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I used the square babysitter for a second. Sure. You know, and I, we shouldn't do that. You know, we have to keep our kids really busy. Do what you do with them. Absolutely. And instill stuff. Because he's key. I get into video games with him. I'm playing Cars 3 with him now. And he actually whipped me up a, a uh, five-year-old. Five and a half, dude. I can't win a race, Josh. And uh, my mother-in-law has been in town. And she said, uh, she went up to him and said, hey, go up to daddy and put the L and say loser. So now I got my kid running around calling me a loser. I, you know? I played Madden for the first time last, like, February. And I was like. My friend's son, not really my nephew, but it's like my Yeah, nephew. of course. I got some of those. So I played him in Madden. I was like, I'm going to demolish this kid. Smashed you. Oh, no chance. I had no chance. Yeah, dude, my five and a half year old, he's like whipping me in races. I'm like, you can't. Even... He's like, don't worry, daddy. Uh, you'd beat me in real life because I can't reach the pedals. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, man, I love this kid. Day in and day out, he just says stuff like that. And it's the sure. best stuff ever. I can start talking about my family. That's it. You know what I mean? Hey, you and I, you had some numbers. 2,000 people died of opioid overdoses last year in Massachusetts, and that's underreported, I think. Mm. You do too. Uh, 42,000 in the country, underreported. Mm. Again, that was 2016. Center for Disease Control is always a year back. I learned that actually this past week. I sit down with Reverend Lemer about our suicide show we're coming up with. So they're back a year and a half, but 45% of those deaths are fentanyl related. Should we classify fentanyl as something other than just a... Class A drug, or they put in fentanyl and everything now, man. From weed, weed, everything, coke, dude. Coke, from what I hear, you know, it's they're making perk thirties out of it. You know, it just they they have to do something about it because it's it's ruining not only lives, it's ruining families, it's ruining neighborhoods, and I think it's disgusting that it just is around so much. It really bothers me, you know. Fentanyl really, it's a scary, scary word, you know? It kills instantly. Car fentanyl, can, you can have the size of a pinhead, and if it touches you, if it touches you, you can drop. Yeah, I'm trying to get the uh, Joint Task Force for uh, hazardous material. I sent out an email to have them come and demonstrate all that stuff to see the scientific, yeah, you know, what they're doing out there and how they detect it and how sure. crazy it is that they can actually, what, you know, to show people exactly what it is yeah. and how to do it, you know? and you know, how they risk their lives to try to help people by detecting right. these things, you know. Uh, police officers every day, when they go on these raids, you hear about it every day. They're overdosing. Yeah, patting somebody down. They're overdosing. And there's really no... How do you feel about, like, 
Man, when we were younger, it was just regular Percocets or Vicodins. Why the hell did we get to a back gate get you Percocets? I had teeth money removed. It's all man. about money, man. That's all it is. And, you know, if it's allowed to be made and allowed to be regulated and the government makes money off it, then that's what's happened. So be it, huh? Yeah, unfortunately. It's a damn shame. Hey, we got about 10 minutes left, less than that. What do you want to talk about that we haven't touched upon? You'll be back, so I mean, you're going to be back for the fantasy yeah, football absolutely. episode that I, I I told them I'm going to win. So I'm going to, we're going to have to share knowledge. I'm going to have to definitely get on my podcast game, man. Because the only time I listen to it's during fantasy. Yeah. I just think I want to like tell people: drug addict, mental illness, whatever you do, and everyone's going to have bad days, and no one's perfect. Just try to be compassionate. Try to be a good person, you know? Like, and I'm not perfect and I have bad days. Everyone does, but just, you never know what the person's going through. You know, you might see a homeless guy. You could see a kid. If you're a high school student and kid that's getting picked on, go sit with them, talk to them. Find out what their life's like, you know? It's so easy. It's so easy to not worry about other people or make a comment or feel a certain way when you're sitting in a nice car or you're going to a house. You don't know, that person could have 10 people in their house. They may not have food to eat, you know? They could have holes in their shoes. And until you've walked a mile in them, you don't know what they're going through. You really don't. And I think the compassion of the world, like as a, Dr. Rocha always says it, people need to be more compassionate, you know? I, uh, that's why I started the show off um, the way I did, you know? I get slapped with this stuff once in a while from loved ones, you know, and we all, we're all broken, man. Yeah. And for us to sit there and judge, and especially being a Christian, when rule number one, being a Christian, is uh, you can't judge, man. There's only one, one perfect man that walked this earth. Sure. You know, and it wasn't me. You know, and sometimes it's hard to forget that, and sometimes it's hard to... Life gets in you, man. Nobody's perfect, you know. I have my faults. Uh, Sometimes I think I got them worked out, and then uh, reality smacks me in the yeah. face. And that's kind of like being an addict. Sometimes you think you work out, and you slip up, and you know, you're back running again. Right. Who do, you, who do you attribute your success to in recovery right now? Like you're at a point now where you're doing so well. You did it by yourself. You did it through the grace of God. You know, so you didn't do it by yourself. You did it by high power. I mean, like, how, like, who do you... like? Look in that camera right now and say thank you to who these people are that think, like, you know what I mean? Well, God is the most important person by Amen. far. Amen. Uh, you know, my, my parents never gave up on me. You know, Chris and Mike, Heron always helped me. Bobby Egan, all the people I work with, you know, like I said before, my friends, the Dubois's, you know, my friends, the Fabian family, the Smiths, like I had solid people I could count on that grab my back. Andy Lang, I mean, Brian Rudolph, you know, everybody, huh? Juan, uh, my man. There's 10,000 people I could name, you know, people I work with on a day to day basis, the people over at Athletes First, you know, that never judged me and let me work there. The just uh, this, the people at CrossFit, my buddy Alex, Jay Caldas, I mean, Ryan Saucier, I can name a thousand people, you know, I can name a thousand people, but. Without God, I, I'm not here right now. I'm not breathing because I've done stuff that, you know, I'm not proud of. And, you know, that with the other people that were there with me, I'm, I'm breathing right now, you know. Uh, so without God, I mean. Nothing's possible. No. Hey, Amen, man. I really can't really beat that one. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing more to say except for, let me ask you. You were going through a little tough time the week prior to this show. Mm. Now you've been on two weeks in a row. Mm. Has this helped you? Yeah, absolutely. Does, does, does the public speaking and the, oh, yeah. the getting on the camera like yeah. we are tonight, does, you know, the, when you go to a school? Sure. Helping, my job helps me anytime I'm going through something tough. That's kind of like my, my gift as well, I think, is helping people, working with kids. And, you know, I'm doing that every day. And it's, it's when I'm complacent if I'm going through a tough time that, you know, it becomes harder. But when you stay busy... Like you said, and I'm busy a lot. Busy is good. And, you know, the days just kind of go on and then time passes and everything's good again. You know what I mean? One day at a time. That's it. 
live for today. Tomorrow's Friday. We got the big Cape Verdean tournament Saturday down at Monty's Park. A lot of New Bedford guys will be playing in it. Uh, it's a great basketball tournament. If people like basketball, I suggest they go down there and watch it. It's all day. Hey, you're still in pretty good shape, but can you still run up and down the court? Of course I can. Man, I haven't played in a while. We play at work. I better be able to run it up and down. It hurts, man. Like, you wake up and you're just like, ugh. I, went on this, I used to play all yeah. the time. It's just... I went on the obstacle course yesterday, though, and I tried to dive in front of one of the guys. It was Wilson that was commenting, yeah. and his leg, like, hit my neck. And obstacle course. We had an obstacle course set up at work. Like a, a, uh, this is like double dare, bro? You gotta, yeah, oh yeah, for fun, I set gotta... us up with it. Big deflatable obstacle course. I tried to dive through it, and I'm like... Yeah, of course. I'm 37. I'm not 17, but I forget. Yeah. That's, uh, oh, man, I gotta, get to, I gotta stop by. You owe us a tour. I do. Get it. Get us a day when we're on uh, obstacle course, so Josh can videotape yeah. me busting my ass. Sure, it'd be pretty good uh, to show people. Uh, try to stay in shape, but man, my athletics is gonzo. I can't even play video games these days. Nick, thank you so much for the yeah. past two weeks. You've provided a you. uh, countless amount of people with information, uh, inspiration. I mean, you did get told today. Tell a story about on the way here, man. A lady you. just said to me, I was over at Vasco, you know. It's a spot I like to go to a lot. My buddy Eric owns it, and he's a great guy, great chef. And a lady just told me I gave her hope, you know, that one day everything will be all right in her life with her family. And that's why I'm here. That's why I do this. That's what it's all about to me. If someone's laying on the ground on the back with a hand in the air, I'm going to grab it and pull them up because that's what people did for me. They pulled me up when I needed to be pulled up, and they still do. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. Thank you for having me. Nick and I uh, both wearing our... Uh, we didn't plan this. <laughs> he wore it better, though. He's, he's a little better shape, but he gets paid to do that. So. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, I won't blame it on genetics. I'll blame it on he gets paid to work out. <laughs> Nick Korea, guys. Great guest. He'll be back. Uh, we've had great viewership watching Nick. And there's a reason because he, he's real. You know, He shows people... That everything can work itself out. Uh, Tommy also brought up everybody has a different plan. So if God isn't your thing, and I really hope you try it, uh, you might be surprised. But if it's not your thing, whatever works, you know, uh, whatever your inspiration may be, try to try to get better, try to get well, and uh, I'll try to do the same. You know, I don't have addiction, but I have issues. Everybody does. Be kind. Everybody's broken. Let's just try to help each other out. Uh, if you know or need any help or information, uh, you can always reach out to me at Chris at New Bedford Guide. Message me through the uh, Chris Rosendi Show page. Uh, I'll try to get you some help. Uh, I've got a great team between Jamie Casey, Revelima, Nick Correa, Kevin Rosario. It's been awesome. I, I mean, I've got a bunch of these guys now on speed dial that I can get you in touch with should the need arise. Uh, next week, we are going to start a brand new project, and uh, it's going to start here on the Chris Rosendi Show. I am starting a brand new podcast. That uh, It's going to be a strictly a podcast that once in a while will cross it over onto my show. Uh, Jen Blum and I are getting together, and we are starting a new podcast based on domestic violence and getting help. Uh, she has coined the, the podcast name uh, Survivor Speak. That is our new show, and that will be on next week. Next week we have uh, Shelly, a friend of Jen's, who's a professional boxer. And uh, we're pretty excited to uh, get her on next week. It will be the three of us. It will be our inaugural uh, show and podcast, and uh, we hope to see you next week. Everybody, be kind. God bless. Work on yourself to be a better person so you can help others. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Hi, guys. Richard Sullivan here again. We're going to preview a new dish for our new menu coming up here at the Cast and Pig. we got pork belly and summer squash medley. A little bit of blistered cherry tomatoes that we're going to do. And seared scallops. Ball pepper. Nice hot pan. Sprig of thyme in there. Helps with the flavor. Mm. 
you're really going to want these cherry tomatoes to get a nice color on them. Red pepper uh, for blanc. So we have our base sauce right here. Add it right into the pan. And add some heavy cream in there. Number blanc. Basically means butter sauce. Get back into this. We're gonna finish that off. Shut off the heat. Just let this butter take over. These are fresh scallops. I'm just gonna coat them generously with a little bit of salt and pepper. We're gonna go right into a pan. Nice sear on them. And shut them off. Finish that. Little baby spinach. Just let that get lightly wilted and it's all set. It's gonna be generous. We don't have to be too neat with it. Did that salad go good? What salad? Very simple, perfect summer dish.